going to um, um, get us going on the next stage of the of the presentations, and I'm going to introduce to you Dr. Josh Hutchison. Our department is very fortunate that we have partnered with two engineering research centers on these consortiums, one of which Dr. Gordana mentioned, the CellMet, and the other one is PathSub. And we have the engineer tissue model systems as one of our three research areas. And of that, in particular, the heart and circulation are of special interest to us. And Dr. Hutchison himself is engaged in that. He and another professor, Dr. Sharan Ramaswamy, take the lead on celebrating February as Miami Heart Month. We have many talks and presentations related to the heart, the cardiovascular system, et cetera. So with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Hutchison, who, uh, who will uh, who will give, a, give you an overview about the department and introduce us to the next setup for the day. Dr. Josh Hutchison. Thank you, Dr. John. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the research that we do in, in our lab. Uh, and then um, uh, my colleagues, Dr. Ramaswamy and Dr. Suthi, are going to talk about some of the research in, in their labs. But before I really get to, to our work, uh, I wanted to first remind you of, of why we're here today and, and introduce a little bit of, of Dr. Gomez's uh, work. Um, I believe Dr. Rier is going to do this uh, much more in depth uh, later today. Um, but Dr. Gomez was really a pioneer in our understanding of blood flow and blood distribution and how things like hypertension affects that. Uh, and, and also, as was just mentioned in the last lecture, uh, the architecture of the lung uh, and really provided some, some new insight uh, at a time that was really early. And, and the thing that is you know, most important, I think, to, to realize is that this is a time when biomedical engineering did not exist. Uh, so he was really taking uh, knowledge from math and from physics and from engineering and applying it to and integrating it with biology and medicine. Uh, and so a lot of his early work preceded, so those of us who are in the field, maybe you know of Hodgkins and Huxley um, or uh, YC Fung. Uh, so, you know, people who did, who understood action potentials or people who understood biomechanics, for, you know, or described them for the first time. A lot of this early work preceded that, and then some of the later work was contemporaneous with it. Uh, so really early uh, understanding of, of how we might be able to use the tools of engineering to, uh, to describe things like blood flow or, or, or lung function. So, so I'm going to tie that into research that we're doing in the department now. And, and again, I think this is a, a direct lineage from, from some of this, you know, these early pioneers in biomedical engineering. So uh, FIU biomedical engineering really can trace its root back, roots back to 1997. Um, and uh, the, the heart of our department, no, well, I guess pun intended, uh, is in cardiovascular uh, systems. Uh, and so we were established as the Cardiovascular Engineering Center uh, in 1997, and then in 1998 received a, a, a donation from Norman Weldon, who was with the Cordis um, company that is a cardiovascular related company, uh, to allow us to begin doing undergraduate research. And we've been very fortunate since then to grow an endowment, uh, starting with a, a, a donation from the Whitaker Foundation uh, to establish a Biomedical Engineering Institute, and then later, which was really transformational for our department, uh, a, a endowment that was started by the Wallace H. Coulter Foundation with a gift from the uh, state of Florida, gave us a $10 million endowment that uh, in 2000, three years later, we used to, to start our department and became the Department of Biomedical Engineering. So from that, we have branched out, and as Dr. Jung mentioned, we have these three different uh, focus areas. Um, but even though we've gotten broad and gotten bigger, and, and uh, as of this last year, now rank as a top 50 public uh, graduate program, uh, we still have uh, a really strong uh, cardiovascular related research that I'll get to in a moment. But what we try to do here, and I think what biomedical engineering is in general, is really doing what Dr. Gomez did 70 plus years ago now, um, where we're talking about uh, taking tools from engineering, uh, different, you know, our understanding of differential equations, instrumentation, signal processing, computation analyses, biomechanics, things like that, and fully integrating it with knowledge from medicine and biological sciences, not just applying it, but fully integrating the two. So talk, you know, understanding cellular and molecular biology and genetics and biostatistics and physiology and putting these things together to really help us model and solve problems related to 
um, to human physiology and human pathology. And that's really where, where our goals lie. And you'll see that in the research uh, that I present moving forward. So I, so I wanna, before I get to our work, start with some things that are going on around um, uh, the department. And so um, I'm hope, I hopefully won't butcher these slides too much. These are uh, uh, from other labs. Uh, this is, is work from Dr. Uh, Gattavardi, um, who is in our optical group. So, so really focuses on uh, imaging modalities, but still using those imaging modalities to look at um, uh, blood perfusion, look at, look at oxygenation in tissues that goes along with, with blood perfusion. And she and I are collaborating on, on this particular project here. She's actually imaging one of, one of our mice um, in the lab, but really to understand how things that we study, like arterial calcification, art, you know, arterial pathologies, artery diseases, how that influences changes in tissue oxygenation in the periphery. So then you can use that for diagnostic procedures, right? Uh, you can go into the clinic perhaps, or maybe you can make a wearable or uh, some kind of device that can help monitor patient health over time. So fully integrating, uh, you know, imaging technologies with understanding of, of impact to, uh, to tissue health. Uh, the second uh, that I wanted to focus on today is, is you've heard from Dr. Jung, our uh, research from, from her lab, which is trying to uh, improve uh, ventilation systems and really developing closed loop controllers for pacing of ventilation systems that, that don't just do this unnatural pacing, but use neural and physiological cues to help a ventilator control breathing in a more natural manner. And so this is um, uh, work that was uh, done by a, a recent graduate student of hers. And there's uh, two patents that have been granted and one pending on this. Uh, and it's been evaluated in computational studies and in rodent models. And so she hopes to be able to move this to the, to the clinic soon. And then finally, before we get to, to our work, uh, this is work that, that I also have collaborated on with Dr. Jessica Miller Roman. Uh, so I should, should have mentioned Dr. Jung is in the neuro, the neuro um, engineering uh, group. Dr. Miller Roman is also in the optical imaging uh, group here at, in our department. And, but this is work again, similar in some ways to what Dr. Gattavardi is doing, looking using optical techniques to try to understand motion of blood vessels. So as blood moves through, as your heart pumps, each time your heart pumps, your vessels are expanding and contracting and trying to use optical signals of that expansion and contraction um, to understand how that vessel wall might be changing. And so different pathologies, hypertension can, can affect how this wall moves. And so maybe we can make wearable devices that, um, that can help us uh, uh, monitor blood pressure in patients who are most at risk. Um, and so you, you, uh, this is kind of something that, that is, a, is a big goal of people like you know, Apple Watches uh, to be able to develop something like this. And this is something she's working on using finite element modeling, using pretty complex computational models combined with optical imaging, combined with what we know about how vessels function uh, to really make uh, smart wearables that can, that can do this. And also thinking through, as we bring in that biomedical engineering, how do things like skin color affect this? How do things like obesity affect this? Um, so again, not just starting with developing a technology, but integrating that technology in a way that's going to, with our understanding of physiology and pathology in a way that can make a real impact. So now to, to the things that we do uh, in our lab, uh, we really try to understand the molecular mechanisms through which cells maintain and remodel tissue, especially in, in the context of, of cardiovascular disease. Uh, and we integrate both mechanics and biology into, uh, into our analyses. So, um, you know, I just mentioned to you that each time the heart pumps, your vessels are expanding and contracting. Uh, so we look at the arteries, that th those vessels that expand and contract. We also look at the aortic valve. Uh, which, which opens and closes and lets blood out of the heart and then closes to keep blood from going back in. Uh, and it has to do this over 30 million times per year. Uh, and altered structures in these tissues uh, are the leading cause of death in the world. Even though we've learned a lot about cardiovascular disease and have new therapies, people you know, out there in the audience might be taking things like statins that lower your lipids. Uh, even with all of that, this remains the global leading cause of death. And we're trying to understand why these tissues were modeled in the first place. So I'll show you a bit about our work in the arteries. Um, 
and I have the aortic valve on here too, but the point is that both of these structures, the aortic valve and the coronary artery have a very, you know, we, we like to think of these as uh, sometimes as just tubes, um, but they have a microarchitecture. They have this structure of all these fibers and cells that make them up uh, that really dictate their function. And it's when things go wrong uh, in this microarchitecture that causes our big problems. And so if we're thinking about things like a heart attack, uh, you might have this image in your mind that uh, a heart attack occurs when you get this buildup of plaque. Um, uh, and, and certainly our Western diet contributes to that, but we know that even uh, mummies from uh, uh, centuries ago, uh, millennia ago, uh, had uh, atherosclerosis. Uh, these plaques build up and uh, and maybe your doctor has to go in and put a stent in or do some kind of angioplasty. Um, but the worst case scenario is when this plaque actually ruptures and your body treats it as a wound. Platelets rush in and they try to block this wound here, but in the end, they block that coronary artery. They actually fill this whole um, lumen here and blood can no longer flow to your heart. And that's what causes the heart attack. And the, the most predictive um, uh, score or uh, the, the best predictor we have of, of these kind of acute events, these, these sudden heart attacks, uh, is what's known as a calcification score. So for reasons that we don't quite understand, uh, in diseased cardiovascular tissues, both the aortic valve that I mentioned before and the coronary artery, uh, mineral forms, almost looks like bone. Uh, and we know that the more mineral you have there, the worse your prognosis is. Uh, to the point now, even where if the, if the mineral is really low, if calcification is really low, the American Heart Association says, even if you have high lipids, moderately high lipids, high cholesterol, uh, you might cannot take statins because your risk is so low. But then conversely, if you have really high mineral, your, your risk is really high. And this is also a prominent feature in things like chronic kidney disease and, and, and these cardiorenal interactions, cardio, cardiac and kidney interactions are, are certainly a thing that, that uh, Dr. Gomez was interested in early on as well. So we try to understand on a very molecular level you know, very fundamental level, how this calcification starts in the first place. And we've identified these little small vesicles that these cells release. So there's cells that exist in these tissues and they release these little vesicles and these vesicles get calcium and phosphate together and start that mineralization process. And we're trying to really understand what makes that occur and, and, and what we can do to potentially stop it. This is a very complex slide, but what I really want to do is, is bring home the fact that we're studying the mechanics here. So how do mechanical factors influence this and how does that interplay with the biology, right? So we have to have full knowledge of both. So when you stretch the cell, the cell is sitting in these dynamic tissues and suddenly you have hypertension. Suddenly your blood pressure goes up. The cell gets stretched more. And what we find is when things like that happen, it greatly influences the trafficking and how cells, how proteins within these cells move around. And, and, it, that, and these pro, the movement of these proteins is related to the formation of those vesicles that ultimately calcify. And so we're trying to understand how those mechanics influence the biology, which ultimately influences the pathology, the disease that forms uh, in the tissue. And a lot of this is, this is work done by um, Mohamed Shaver, who's a PhD student in the lab. And that by knowing that basic biology and understanding the mechanisms at play, one thing that we're doing now is going back and saying, are there ways that we can target these mechanisms with clinically relevant uh, therapeutics? And, and one strategy that we take, Dr. Gordana mentioned earlier, uh, this problem of trying to translate drugs um, to the clinic. And, and one of them is, just, is, is a problem of safety and not knowing whether a drug can actually be safely tolerated in humans. And one way we have gotten around to that is we look for targets that are already clinically approved so that there's already drugs existing that have gone through clinical trials and we say can we repurpose them and and, and and are these targets relevant for our disease and can we can repurpose them that that will hopefully expedite um, that translation to the clinic because then we just have to prove efficacy we don't have to prove safety anymore and we have uh, preclinical models like the ones that she mentioned so we're looking at atherosclerosis uh, these are uh, mouse models we mostly used and we can map out how this pathology occurs in these mice. This is actually a whole mouse aorta that you're looking at here. 
Uh, and we have these different drugs and we're showing this many, that some of the drugs, I'll show you two today, this is targeting a specific protein, RxFP1 relaxin, which has actually been related to hypertension, um, that by targeting these proteins, we can decrease the calcification that I was talking to you about earlier. This is, a, and that was all work done by Dr. Hui Ng, who's a, um, a postdoc in the lab. Uh, uh, Amarala Bakshian Nick is a, another PhD student. He's focused on uh, epidermal growth factor receptor, which is uh, we found as a key player in the formation of those vesicles I was talking about. And similarly, using a, this is in a chronic kidney disease model, he's shown by targeting this receptor with an inhibitor, uh, he can reduce calcification uh, in these models, in, the, in these aorta, these mice. Um, and we have patents pending on, on these, these targets. And these are at least the, especially the, the, cal, the EGFR inhibitor here, the actual molecules that, that we're using are clinically used molecules for treatment of things like cancer currently. Um, and so there, there is a path forward potentially for, um, for translating these, uh, these findings. Um, we're also interested in diagnostics. And so it's not just treating patients, but sometimes it's also about finding patients. Uh, and this is especially a big problem in underserved and underrepresented communities. So um, folks that may not have uh, great access to healthcare. Um, and what happens in a lot of these communities is that early problems, early warning signs of disease get ignored and not treated and lead to bigger problems later on, which leads to bigger interventions, which drives up the cost of healthcare. And so we're trying to develop ways, very low cost ways to find these patients and stratify patient risk early that can be done in point of care um, uh, situations. And so this is work by Lin Tong, another PhD student in the lab, who's developing these microfluidic devices. You can imagine taking just a finger prick, a small uh, drop of blood and loading this device, and it will look for different proteins that are in that blood that we know are associated with disease. And so we can say if you have a certain pro, if these this certain protein is higher than a certain level, then uh, then you may want to go get additional tests done. You may want to have some kind of intervention done. So those are the kinds of things that that we're looking at there. So uh, I mentioned the aortic valve, and I, I want to make sure I told all the students in the lab that I would show their pictures at least, uh, at least once. And so I'm trying to, to keep that promise. Um, but, uh, and this, this is provided by Denise Shu. And I think a lot of her work might be uh, uh, talked about by uh, Dr. Ramaswamy because Denise is, is co-advised by us. Um, but Denise does a lot of work on the, on the aortic valve and understanding this, the mechanics of the opening and closing the aortic valve and how that leads to disease. Uh, she provided this, this awesome video of aortic valve. So you can see these thin little leaflets of the aortic valve, these thin little membrane structures that open when the heart pumps and snap shut when the heart closes. And during disease, what happens is these leaflets become very thickened and again, calcified. So these are actually calcified nodules on there. So that bone light nodule that I was talking about before. And you can imagine it makes it much harder for the heart to pump and open up these valves. Uh, and so we're trying to also understand why that happens. And it seems to be, uh, mechanics seem to play an important part. So hypertension, again, for example, is uh, an important risk factor for aortic stenosis and for this to, to occur. And so we're looking at the cell populations. So unlike in the artery, in the aortic valve, we really don't understand a lot about the cells that make it up. Uh, surprisingly. And we're discovering or identifying at least new cell populations that haven't really been reported, neurons and glial cells that you don't really think about too much in these connective tissues um, that are present. And, uh, and, and we have some, some data, this is work by Daniel Chaparro, another PhD student in the lab. Uh, we have data that manipulating these cells can alter um, the structure of the valve. And we can do mechanical testing. So we've, we've developed ways to even in mouse valves, so we use mice for these, to, to test these small little tiny tissues in the mice. We can pull on them and use principles of mechanics to understand how their structure and how the changes in the cells changes the function. And we're hoping eventually to correlate that to understanding genetic malformation. So the eight, bicuspid aortic valve is one of them. It, it is the most common cardiovascular genetic malformation that happens in about one to two percent of the population uh, and leads to valve disease later in life. So we're, we're trying to understand that process. And similar to uh, the, the vessel, we're also trying to develop 
low cost screening techniques for um, aortic valve as well. Um, so many patients with aortic valve disease are asymptomatic. Uh, you might feel a little short of breath. You might feel a little tired. Um, and we've, uh, it's been reported that uh, especially underserved and underrepresented populations uh, don't report those symptoms. Uh, they think that they just need to go on with life. And in the meantime, your aortic valve is deteriorating in function, which causes a lot of other heart problems that could be avoided if we intervene earlier. And so this is a lot of work developed by Valentina Dargham, another PhD student in the lab, um, lucky to have a, a, an awesome team that's um, uh, really looking at heart sounds. Um, so when a doctor listens to your heart, he or she hears love dub, love dub. Those sounds, that actual dub sound um, is the closure of the aortic valve leaflet. So when those valve leaflets come together, they vibrate a little bit and that's what produces that sound along with the blood vibrations. And, um, and doctors often listen for sounds un in addition to those lub and dub, they're looking for extra sounds that might indicate disease, but we're focusing on the dub itself. We're focusing on the frequencies in that, the minor frequency changes in that, in that um, vibration that might tell us something about changes in the structure. And, and I'm gonna give a shout out to my wife here who's actually a, um, a classically trained opera singer. And this idea came about when she and I were talking about how the vocal folds look a lot like aortic valve leaflets. And that people who have vocal fold problems, they have these structural changes in the vocal folds that actually look a lot like the structural changes we see in aortic valve leaflets when you get disease. And so the idea is that structure changes a little bit and perhaps that frequency of that dub is gonna change just enough for us to detect it. And so we're trying to use a digital stethoscope to record heart sounds and then analyze them and see if we can um, find very subtle changes in, in aortic valve structure is a very early indicator of aortic stenosis and aortic valve disease. So that's it for our group. As Dr. Guadana mentioned, we uh, unfortunately have been mostly separated for the, for the past year. Uh, so this is one of those Zoom pictures of, of us together. Um, uh, this, at least this is, this is most of the group. It's a very talented group of individuals. I'm extremely fortunate to be a part of this group uh, and to work with all these smart people on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we've been funded by the Florida Heart Research Foundation, um, Paths Up, which is our, one of the NSF engineering research centers that Dr. Jung mentioned, and the American Heart Association. And we're very grateful to them for funding. So with that, I will stop my share and I will invite Dr. Ramaswamy to join. All right, thank you. Um... Good morning, everybody, and uh, it's uh, my honor to be here on this um, very important day and celebration um, on behalf of uh, Dr. Gomez. And so let me go ahead and share my screen so that we can get started. Uh, just give me a second here. Um, again, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Sharan Ramaswamy. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering here at FIU. And, um, um, I'm also um, involved in um, cardiovascular research, which is my main area of expertise. And the topic for uh, today's talk, uh, I've kept it very broad and I'm trying to keep the discussion today um, fairly broad um, so that, you know, we have sort of a, a general understanding of um, the the rationale and justification for why we need uh, research within the area of heart valve diseases and why heart valve regeneration is an important topic of research. So with that in mind, uh, let me go ahead and go to the next slide. So um, I'm just gonna give some background and significance um, on heart valve and heart valve disease, okay? And um, heart valve disease is uh, a problem that occurs both in uh, adults as well as in children. Um, it is uh, a fairly common uh, disorder when a child is born with a heart valve defect. You can see here on this particular screen, 
there are uh, a couple of examples of types of defects. For example, pulmonary atresia, where the valve itself, the pulmonary valve is missing. Um, there are uh, multiple cardiovascular defects where there is a ventricular septal defect and there are some valve anomalies that accompany it, uh, truncus arteriosus, and so on. So here you also have uh, a ventricular septal defect. So sometimes these cardiovascular birth defects are fairly complex because they involve multiple uh, issues with the heart, but typically the valve is one of those components that is uh, severely compromised. And unfortunately, because of the um, lack of prosthetic valves that can accommodate uh, you know, a small child, uh, the sizing of a small child, and also the fact that children grow, accounting for the somatic growth is particularly important. It's essentially, the valve needs to grow with the child. So, it, you know, I think um, Dr. Um, Wunjek Novakovic had mentioned this, uh, you know, idea of um, essentially, uh, you know, targeting uh, specific patients and where there's a need uh, to really, you know, go from um, bedside to the bench. And we've taken on a similar approach, recognizing that um, while tissue engineering is a field that is potentially something that could be useful in the treatment of uh, adults with valve disease, it is, of course, children with valve disease where it is most urgently needed because right now there aren't any viable treatment to treat children with critical um, congenital heart valve diseases. Okay, so that being said, um, here's a picture of a native aortic valve and the field of heart valve tissue engineering or trying to regenerate heart valves has been ongoing for the last um, 25 years or so. Here you see that the cross section of a native aortic valve consists of these three specific layers. And so early work in the field, uh, you can see here by Rabkin et al, attempted to recapitulate the three critical layers of the valve that consists of very specific biochemistry that allows the valves to be able to function mechanically. What do valves do? They open and close. They ensure that in the ideal scenario that blood flow from the heart is unidirectional and we don't get backflow. And of course, um, you know, or early uh, you know, thoughts were that this is really just a passive structure, but we now know that it's a lot more complex. It's very active and it's actively remodeling and changing its morphology based on the pressure and flow conditions surrounding it. So it is a very mechanical sensitive organ. And so if it is unable to maintain that function of unidirectional blood flow, unfortunately, that if untreated and leads to um, extreme severity will lead to heart failure. And so early work here demonstrated by Rapkin et al showed that these three layers could be recapitulated in in vitro culture. And so um, as also was uh, mentioned by Dr. Wunjek Novakovic, you know, bioreactors are typically used to recapitulate some of the um, environments that um, valves or, you know, different tissue structures can be used to be cultured, to essentially grow them to a form that is perhaps more conducive for integration within the body. So within the tissue engineering paradigm, it's no different. You have folks who basically just put cells and scaffolds together because of course we're trying to create a 3D construct. They implant it. They don't really use a bioreactor. Um, other people may just use direct cell therapy. Um, and we are also examining some of the um, you know, secretions that cells can produce that potentially may help cardiovascular tissues that are, are diseased. Others may use just a raw scaffold without the need for any cell or other intervention through some scaffold processing. We've also looked into that. And last but not least, 
you could have um, you know cell scaffolds with uh, maturation in a bioreactor, and that in of itself could be an engineered tissue model system for drug di drug discovery efforts or other therapeutic uh, research efforts to have a model system that mimics human tissues, because we know that we have animal studies, but unfortunately, there aren't really any precise animals that mimic the human response. So having a, a in vitro system to mimic uh, valve disease would be of great benefit, particularly for drug, drug discovery purposes. And of, of course, potentially, there are uh, possibilities to even translate that to um, you know, in vivo studies. And we have also taken some efforts in this particular uh, strategy as well. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about these things. And so, um, so you know, I mentioned that native valves are extremely uh, mechanically connected. Valves undergo complex shape changes they uh, experience large degree of stretches, which are totally anisotropic. So in other words, there's directional dependence on how they stretch. The stretch rates can be as high as a thousand percent per second. And the uh, bottom line is that the deformation and movement of the valves and its leaflets um, to facilitate a unidirectional flow so that blood, let's say, from the aortic valve is, you know, essentially passing through from the, you know, from the heart through the aorta to the systemic circulation in a one directional manner so that our systemic circulation can, um, you know, receive uh, the nutrients that it needs. And similarly, of course, we would expect the same for the other three valves. So there are four valves in the body and they all have their functions. So on the left side, we have the mitral valve, which is a valve that allows the filling of the left ventricle from the left atrium um, so that that can actually then be uh, you know, ejected through the aortic valve and then into the systemic circulation. So it's a very, very, while seemingly a simple pro procedure, they're all largely connected and it, everything depends on the timing and the structures and the mechanics. And in that context, um, you know, if something were to go wrong, then, you know, the whole system gets affected in a very, very negative way. And I think in that context, of course, uh, one has to credit um, Dr. Gomez uh, because he was one of the pioneers connecting a lot of the uh, mat mathematics associated with the circulation. And in fact, just as an example, um, there was a study in 1946 that demonstrated that in the tricuspid valve uh, insufficiency, there is some uh, accommodation by the right ventricular pressure which changes to, 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 can, to temporarily sustain right side cardiac function. So even in the case of the tricuspid valve, which is again between the, um, the right atrium and the right ventricle, if it begins to malfunction, it appears that the right ventricular pressure changes are able to temporarily accommodate that insufficiency. However, in the mitral valve, which is basically between the left atrium and the left ventricle, the prolapse or basically the murmur that uh, essentially, you know, Dr. Hutchinson talked about heart sounds. There's also a murmur that's created and where basically um, the valve is not uh, allowing blood to, uh, you know, be retained within the um, left ventricle, okay, the valve is not closing properly, and you get leakage back into the left atrium, and, you know, you have the leaflets of the valve sticking out into the atrium during that process when it's supposed to be closed. That's mitral valve insufficiency. Unfortunately, on the, on the left side of the heart, given the high, much higher pressure gradient requirements, um, well, when there is mitral valve insufficiency, there is no temporary accommodation. That is a very serious problem that needs immediate, immediate medical attention. Uh, 
And I bring your attention to the publications of Bloomfield uh, et al. You know, reported on the studies with tricuspid valve, but really the the important uh, connection with the right side and the temporary sustenance for right side cardiac function uh, to accommodate some tricuspid valve insufficiency has to also be credited to Dr. Gomez um, in his um, you know, pioneering work in, in 1941, uh, hemodynamic et angiocinetic étude rationnelle des lois résistant les phénomènes cardiovasculaires. Uh, Ça fait longtemps depuis je, je parle français. It's been very long since I spoke French, but my rough translation would be that um, that uh, translates to hemodynamics of blood vessels and rational studies of the laws governing cardiovascular phenomena, right? So I think uh, hopefully that provides some context that even um, within the area of valve disease, I believe Dr. Gomez has made some valuable contributions, keeping in mind, connecting the pressures uh, at a time, you know, and, and there's highly complex mathematics that, that are associated with valve dynamics. So making those connections back in the 40s uh, is really quite remarkable, given, of course, um, as um, was also mentioned earlier by Dr. Runjek Novakovic, that at the time, of course, there were you know, limitations in technology that like computers and things like that, that we have today. Um, so that's really remarkable. All right, so then um, one of the areas of um, the um, mechanics that we've been focusing on has to do with the flow environment. And basically we looked at oscillations in flow. We have a device, uh, a patented device known as a flow stretch flex bioreactor. You can see here that you have tissues that are bending and stretching and you have flow happening. Why do we want to mimic flow stretch uh, flex in vitro? Because these are the three native biomechanical environments that valves are subjected to. Okay, so we have a system now to be able to mimic that. And when we look at the, um, when we look at tissues that were grown under this environment, you can see here the oscillations that occur on the top and the bottom of the tissue. And remarkably, if you look at our native valves, and this is an aortic valve, you see that there is on the aortic side, this oscillations that occur naturally. And so from that point of view, and this was again, um, I guess maybe uh, 11 years ago that um, I, I was involved in publishing some of these studies that we were able to, sh to demonstrate that these oscillations may be connected both to healthy valve remodeling as well as to disease. Um, and since then, there have been other studies by other groups um, that have demonstrated that valve oscillations are in fact critical for valve development. So from a tissue engineering standpoint, we felt that oscillatory conditions, if they're important for valve development, would be also important for tissue engineering of valve. And so we did some studies and we've basically shown that oscillatory conditions with a predominant in flex flow states where we flex and flow condition the samples exhibit um, some of the valve re relevant phenotypes um, so they become more like a valve. And also they produce a lot more tissue such as collagen, okay? And the gene expression is also quite connected to um, valve development. You can see here this gene called KLF2A, which is an important gene because um, there was a study that was done um, some time ago um, and we've published a couple of these studies ourselves, but if you look at the studies by Vermo's group, they demonstrated that KLF2A is an important pathway for valve development, and it is actually directly regulated by flow oscillations. And so they block this cell uh, transduction pathway, and, and this was done in the zebrafish uh, model. And what they found is that when they block this pathway, again, which is directly uh, regulated 
through oscillatory conditions, flow, oscillatory flow conditions, the valves were found to be defective. So this clearly demonstrates that flow oscillations are important in developing a valve. However, again, it's a fine line in terms of developing a valve as well as potentially inducing disease. And um, Dr. Hutchinson mentioned Denise, who's being co-advised by both of us, and she's actually examining some of the conditions and oscillations that may lead to valve disease. Um, the studies that I'm going to present here was uh, presented was was uh, largely uh, completed by uh, a recent PhD student of, of mine, Dr. Brittany Gonzalez, who's um, now a postdoc in the lab, uh, and <clears throat> she looked at how we can leverage oscillatory flow conditions to grow a healthy valve. So again, going from um, you know, bedside to the, um, uh, you know, to the bench, we collaborated with a group at Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital who were using porcine small intestinal submucosa, which is basically fancy words for tissues from the small intestine of pigs. And they essentially um, were putting these in compassionate care for children born with a serious mitral valve defect because these were children whose survival was just a, a few days given the criticalness of their condition. So under compassionate care, they put these porcine small intestinal submucosa valves, just a raw scaffold. And they found that they were able to sustain in a fairly um, healthy uh, lifestyle for at least a few years. And in some cases also allow the child to go from um, you know, that very critical state to receive a prosthetic valve later on in life. So given the success that they had with this, we collaborated with them. We used bioengineering tools to figure out what works, what doesn't. And so <clears throat> we did some functionality tests with pieces, you know, basically putting it in a, a valve uh, test duplicator to see how it works. And we found that it does actually mimic a lot of uh, good valve function, you know, the pressure drops are relatively low. And so it's able to, you know, there's very minimal leakage across the valve. Again, these are mitral valves and very comparable to, you know, state-of-the-art bioprosthetic valves that are implanted in adults. So we recognize that the valves were functioning, at least in the acute term, really well. Um, and so then we wanted to understand some of the mechanisms and we found that um, some of the studies, like I said, the valve tests reveal that the valves, the PCS valves work as good as bioprosthetic valves on the market. And it also, we were able to identify specific um, fiber textures, which are really thin, what's called two-ply pieces specimens that are able to function well and function in the long, longer term, because these uh, occur these type of mechanisms occur, what's called crazing and fiber pullout, which allows the valves to increase in their mechanical properties and also allows them to uh, deform. And also because it's viscoelastic tissue, allows them to stretch out. But the, the bad news is essentially it was the material response of the material rather than the biology that was primarily responsible for the valves to grow. Okay, and so how do we know that? We initiated some studies in a non-human primate model, and these are juvenile baboons in the order of about 14 months old. Uh, baboons become adults within five years as opposed to adult, uh, human adults in 18 years. And so given the non-human uh, primate context and the relatively quick uh, process of going from child to adult, we wanted to see if these valves would grow in a juvenile baboon. And so what we've seen here is we've defined some um, metrics to be able to identify what is good growth and what is not so good growth. NAGR is a ratio that basically ideally should be one that shows that the valve is growing uh, ideally with the baboon as the baboon is growing. And we find here that, you know, in humans, the ratio was very close to one. 
In baboons, it was not as good, but it was reasonable. Uh, 0.74, again, one being ideal. That probably makes a lot of sense because humans grow slower than baboons and baboons have to basically, the valve has to grow a lot faster to accommodate the increasing size of the baboon. So we were somewhat um, optimistic about that. We then proceeded to um, do some studies with explants of these valves uh, from the baboons. We found that there was a lot of um, rich um, valve, collagen, elastin, and protoglycan architecture that seemed to increase over time. And so this was encouraging, suggesting that there was de novo valve tissue ingrowth in the baboon model by just putting a raw pieces valve, okay? However, there were, there were some problems. The problems were there were parts of the valve that were still bare. In other words, they were just um, raw scaffold. Core Matrix is the um, scaffold, the company with which we've co been collaborating to get some of these pieces scaffolds. And we found that there was still some uncovered regions of the valve that had residual scaff scaffold there. That leads to calcification in part with the valve, also leads to um, some cells that are irregular shape that seems to be uh, connected to immune cells, which are responding to the sustained exposure of the body to these um, pieces uh, tissue, which of course, pieces being from pigs, and uh, this is in a baboon model. So it appears that there's some kind of a hostile um, immune response. And, and of course, associated with the fact that parts of the valve were still uh, uncovered with de novo tissues from the baboon. So um, <clears throat> we found in other regions of the valve, the mitral valve is a, is a complex apparatus. We need to connect the mitral valve to the heart, to the ventricle. And that was done with chordae tendinae that connects to papillary muscles. And we found that the scaffolds that we use to connect to the papillary muscles grew beautifully. You see there's perfect integration of the neocordae to the papillary muscles. So at some point we said we are, we're not successful at making a complete mitral valve, but if anybody wants to make uh, a, uh, you know, tissue engineer neocordae or chordae tendinae, then all you need is raw pieces. And so we were exploring that possibility as far as like tissue engineering, only the chordae of valves. And this was probably one of the most positive results that we got from the study. Um, but again, other parts of the valve, particularly the leaflets, uh, as well as the annulus region of the valve had a number of um, immune type responses that ultimately led unfortunately to the valve failure even though we did have one candidate that lived um, very well for 20 months until eventually succumbing to a uh, hostile immune response and resulting in valve failure. So um, what does this all mean? What this means is that if we really want to accelerate valve regeneration and to you know, really um, not have uh, exposed areas of scaffold that could you know, ca cause or promote a hostile immune response, and we wanna be able to have the body take over sooner, we need to treat the scaffold with something. Our strategy is to treat it with stem cells. And so we have been looking into that. And again, that was a, a large part of Dr. Brittany Gonzalez's work. And so I'm not gonna talk too much about that, but just to give, a sneak peek into what we have found thus far. We have found that in our bioreactor under certain flow conditions, we've been able to actually generate collagen as well as elastin. And the elastin generation is big because um, for those working in tissue engineering, you know that making de novo elastin in vitro is a big challenge. Yet we were able to produce significant amount of elastin Elastin is also a stimulant for promoting um, in vivo cell migration, chemotaxis, and de novo tissue generation. So our hope is that potentially with this collagen and elastin, extracellular matrix components that we can grow onto the pieces valve before we put it into the animal model, 
we will be able to trigger accelerated regeneration. The other thing we realized is that once the stem cells have secreted all the stuff, there's a paper called uh, you know, progressive reinvention or destination lost talks about this sort of evolution of cardiovascular tissue engineering. And they've shown that when you implant valves with stem cells, that, reads, that leads to a overabundance of fibrotic tissue formation. And that can cause fusion of the valves with surrounding structures, such as you know, the surrounding blood vessel uh, or the surrounding left ventricle. And certainly we don't want a, a valve leaflet to fuse and stop moving. So we recognize the importance that once the stem cells have done their work in vitro, we don't need them anymore. And so we've also developed a um, decellarized engineered tissue protocol. The student involved in that is a current a graduate student in the lab, Ariadna, Har uh, <clears throat> Ariadna Hernandez, and I'm sorry, Ariadna Herrera, excuse me. And um, she um, has been able to safely remove the cells while retaining the collagen and elastin content. So we um, have been examining that and we've actually, we did actually go back and try a baboon study, a very preliminary pilot study you can see here. Um, however, we realized that once these valves are in culture for so long, and maybe this seemed almost common sense, we had all this rich collagen and elastin there, what we realize is that we do need to wean off the constructs from tissue culture. What I mean is that when you have tissues immersed in media and in liquids before being put into uh, animal model, its mechanical properties get altered. So we need to essentially uh, expose it to a procedure to recover the original mecha mechanical properties of the pieces material but now with the elastin and collagen on there, which doesn't really affect the mechanical properties that much, but the moisture and the culture conditions do. So we need to wean it off tissue culture before we can really test this and, and before we can go back to the juvenile baboon model, which we intend to do um, later this year. Um, this study was, this study that this pilot that we did was um, just actually performed um, three months ago, so back in February, um, but we recognized that there were issues with um, the humidified or liquefied valve, and so we, we basically terminated the study, and now we're back to the bench trying to wean off the valves once we've put the uh, engineered tissue on it and, and remove the cells on it, and then finally, can we then restore its original mechanical properties. And that's something that we're, we're actively working on right now. It's something that you don't think about, right? You think, well, okay, everything looks great. And then you say, oh, but yeah, the moisture, the liquid may have compromised the mechanical properties. And so something we should have thought about, but now we know for sure as a fact that this is something that we need to work on as a next step, which is what we're doing. So with that being said, I think it's pretty common now to have these uh, Zoom pictures. Um, and I want to acknowledge on the left here, a number of our clinical collaborators. Uh, a study like this is impossible without strong clinical as well as veterinary co collaborators. The clinicians uh, from Joe DiMaggio Hospital, uh, primarily Drs. Uh, Frank Scholl and, <clears throat> um, and also, um, we have the um, Dr. St uh, uh, Dr. Steve here, um, who also was uh, involved in a number of the uh, Steve Bibevsky, Dr. Steve Bibevsky, who was involved in all the surgeries. So uh, Dr. Frank Scholl and Dr. Steve Bibevsky over here, along with some other clinical collaborators from their cardiac team. It really takes a village. They have to bring their entire cardiac suite of uh, personnel, technicians, and nurses from Joe DiMaggio's Children's Hospital to the vet facility to perform these baboon surgeries. And so really a lot of gratitude goes to them um, to be able to take a day off, you know, from, uh, you know, saving children to basically coming to the vet facility to be involved actively in this research. And of course, the vet facility is at um, the Mannheimer Foundation, which is right here uh, in, in Homestead, Florida. And I'd like to thank a number of um, their um, veterinarians, 
um, uh, in particular, um, Dr. Pablo Morales, who's uh, the vet director there, as well as a number of his uh, technical vet veterinary technicians, uh, veterinary residents, and staffs as uh, other vets and other uh, nursing staff as well, who are taking care of the baboons, both pre-op and post-op. And then in my group, uh, as I mentioned, Dr. Brittany Gonzalez, who's right here, uh, who was primarily involved in a number of the, um, the stem cell associated work with these valves, but pretty much everybody in this picture was in, involved in some capacity. Denise is looking at, looking at flow environments to create, create disease valves, co-advised with Dr. Hutchinson. And this is Ariadna, who's now uh, been uh, successful at uh, removing the stem cells after they've done their job. And now she's uh, actively pursuing some of the re restoration of mechanical properties on these valves so that we can go back to the baboons. With that being said, um, that concludes my talk and uh, thank you for your time and patience. Thank you, Dr. Ramaswamy. So we'll finish our uh, departmental session here with Dr. Sukhya. So you can go right ahead. And afterward, if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to put them in the Q&A box now. We can, we can chat uh, for the leftover time at the end. So my name is uh, Nick Chukyas. I'm an associate professor in the biomedical engineering department. I have been a member of the department since the beginning, since 2003. And uh, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, this opportunity to present some of uh, uh, our research goals and activities. Um, as a mathematical modeler in the vasculature and someone that deals with uh, blood flow and tissue oxygenation, I view my work as a direct continuation of the efforts of Dr. Gomez, one of the pioneers in the use of mathematics in understanding the cardiovascular system. So um, I will try to be brief and try to show um, some slides on how mathematical modeling uh, of the vasculature has developed over the last century and give you a glimpse of uh, where we stand uh, today uh, at this point. So um, my first slide is... Um, um, uh, outlines the leading causes of death in the US from CDC. And I have highlighted three of those, heart disease, stroke, uh, and Alzheimer's. Um, these are major public health problems with uh, an enormous socioeconomic impact. So these conditions look at the first uh, um, unrelated. They affect different organs and they attribute it to different etiology. Uh, however, we know that uh, an individual with cardiovascular risk factors today has an increased chance to develop Alzheimer's. Uh, and this correlation is so strong that um, the suggestion is that um, our best strategy to prevent cognitive decline is um, um, to address um, cardiovascular health through exercise, control of blood pressure, or a healthy diet, diet and et cetera. So, Despite the strong correlation, um, the mechanism responsible for this um, association, so this close association between cardiovascular and brain health is remain for uh, the most part unknown. So what uh, pathological conditions in two different organs, the brain and the heart could have in common? And the answer perhaps is the vasculature. Blood vessels seems to play a critical role in uh, maintaining health both in the heart and in the brain. And we have evidence that vascular dysregulation facilitates the development and progression of pathology in, in both organs. Now, um, in the lab, we focus primarily uh, on the microcirculations. We're speaking about the smallest of blood vessels, blood vessels with diameters less than 200 micron, which is about uh, as thick as a, a piece of your hair. Um, so we have small arteries, arterioles, and capillaries, the, the smallest of the blood vessels, with diameters that um, maybe go uh, as low as five or six microns. So this is an important side of the circulation because this offers the most resistance to blood flow and is, and is the main site for, for the regulation of blood pressure and also the distribution of flow to different um, organs and tissue. Um, these blood vessels are capable of um, contracting and relaxing in response to different stimuli. It can be mechanical, it can be chemical, or even electrical. Now, um, 
Over the year, recent years, we have focused mostly on the cerebral microcirculation. This is a cast uh, showing the, the, the blood vessels in the brain. It's a, it's a fascinating, uh, fascinating system. Uh, it has about, uh, we know that the human brain has about 100 billion neurons and is supplied by almost a thousand miles of blood vessels. So the blood is delivered through um, PL arteries that sits on the surface of the brain that bifurcate and they dive uh, into arterioles that dive into the parenchyma before they give rise to this very dense uh, capillary network. Now, neurons and astrocytes, the brain cells, are in close proximity to the blood vessels and can release different mediators to affect uh, uh, vessel diameter and thus uh, blood supply to the region. Now, um, the communication between um, um, the brain cells and the vasculature is critical for um, uh, normal brain function. The brain has to maximize resource utilization. There is a very high demand for oxygen and nutrients and leave it a very limited space inside the skull. So blood supply needs to be delivered on demand and very efficiently only to the local region of activity. Now, past works have identified uh, a very complex communication uh, mechanism, very complex communication mechanism between the brain cells and the vasculature. First of all, you have multiple cells involved, astrocytes, neurons, um, vascular school muscle and endothelial cells, and we have uh, many medi chemical mediators that can um, facilitate this communication. And most importantly, there is increased evidence today that disruption of this communication, uh, this neurovascular coupling, as we call it, uh, contributes to brain pathologies and to cognitive decline. Um, what uh, perhaps is not uh, sometimes appreciated is that uh, the physiological basis for um, uh, this uh, functional MRI, the, uh, one of the major non-invasive ways to probe uh, uh, brain function has to do with the, um, uh, this neurovascular coupling. So what you see here is pictures that perhaps you have seen before where we see a brain, brain activity lighting up in response to a visual, auditory or other stimuli. Uh, but this, um, this uh, intensity um, only correlates to neuronal activity indirectly. This intensity has to do with increases to local blood flow to this region as a result of active neurons sending signal to the nearby vasculature. So understanding and interpreting fMRIs will benefit from understanding, uh, a thorough understanding and even modeling of how uh, blood vessels respond uh, to neuronal signals. Now, um, despite the, the, the high complexity of system and processes in biomedical field in general and in the cardiovascular in particular, uh, the field has been uh, somewhat resistive to adapt uh, quantitative engineering approaches. Even though um, it's clear that in order to gain a holistic view of very complex mechanisms and uh, multifactorial pathological conditions, such as hypertension or even dementia or heart disease, this can, is going to be difficult to be accomplished without um, uh, a quantitative uh, approach, without using mathematics and modeling. However, this, this view has been beginning to change recently. We have a steady increase in appreciation of mathematical modeling in biosciences. Uh, the models have hold promise to be able to integrate available information, provide framework, frameworks for understanding complex processes, uh, but also link uh, uh, subcellular events, the biology, to macroscopic uh, uh, responses, the, the physiology of the system and the pathology. Uh, finally, uh, by developing, uh, by using mathematics and quantitative approaches and developing mathematical models, this can contribute to a, a revolution that is expected in the, in the medical field, uh, in developing personalized medicine. Mathematical models can contribute in uh, developing um, patient-specific um, uh, investigations and interventions. Now, um, despite uh, what perhaps could be viewed as a kind of slow progress in uh, the mathematical and quantitative physiology, we, did, we do have significant prior contributions. And uh, perhaps if we're going to, to do a small history of the field, maybe we should start almost 100 years ago today when uh, 
August Krog receives the Nobel Prize in Medicine for uh, his work on uh, uh, tissue perfusion and oxygenation. Uh, the Krog uh, tissue uh, cylinder model is one of the uh, most famous and earliest uh, uh, mathematical models in biomedicine. Now, uh, Dr. Gomez, almost 60 years ago, uh, with his work advocated for the use of math and quantitative approaches um, to characterize the cardiovascular and, and respiratory systems and in, in, a, in a large extent provide inspiration for many of the works that follow. Um, looking at his publication, uh, one cannot help um, uh, admire and see the impressive way that he used uh, uh, complex analytical solutions to describe uh, biomedical processes. Today we have the luxury of enormous computational power, so we heavily rely on much simpler numerical approaches to provide solutions. Now, um, what we do in the lab, we try to uh, take advantage of the new tools built of, of uh, past work by pioneers in the field like Dr. Gomez and develop uh, uh, integrated multi-scale models of uh, blood flow control and tissue oxygenation. Uh, we start at the subcellular level, describing models of uh, cell signaling and electrophysiology in different cell types. We couple cells to um, examine responses and signaling in uh, vessels. And to, we can combine vessels to create small uh, vascular networks and see how signals propagate along networks. And we can extend simulations in large vascular networks to uh, simulate uh, blood flow um, and uh, hematocrit distribution uh, and eventually oxygen transport uh, to tissue delivery and oxygen transport to tissue. The overall goal is to one day to link functional imaging to uh, subcellular changes in health and in disease. So I'm not going to um, spend too much time on the methodological details just to briefly mention uh, models of cell electrophysiology that can describe electrical propagation, electrical current propagating through vascular networks, biomechanics that relate electrical signal, chemical signals and pressures to um, uh, vessel diameter, blood rheology that takes into account uh, uh, hematocrit distribution and the effect of hematocrit on uh, blood viscosity, and whole network simulation of uh, blood flow and hematocrit distribution, as well as oxygen transport. And I'm going to give you just um, um, one representative simulation from a recent study that we published last year. What you see here is a, a part of a vascular network with capillaries uh, highlighted with gray color, arteries in red, and some veins in blue. And we stimulate in silico in the computer some of the capillaries with a chemical, in this case is potassium ions, and we monitor and simulate what this will do for the electrical stimulation of the vasculature. And what you see here, we predict that under certain conditions, electrical current can propagate over long distance in the uh, vasculature. Um, this is described by uh, and coined by our experimental collaborators in Vermont as a second nervous system, uh, as the sudden nervous system in the brain. So we have the electrical wiring of the uh, neurons that process information, and we have electrical wiring in the vasculature responsible for efficient delivery of blood flow uh, to the uh, active regions. Um, propagation of current along the vasculature will reach larger vessels, and the current can dilate these vessels, essentially leading to increases in blood supply to the region that we can simulate as you see here. So I'm going to conclude with this uh, as a, uh, the overall theme in our lab, how we can use uh, um, multi-scale modeling approaches to start to link the biology with the physiology, essentially extending and continue work that started decades ago with Dr. Gomez and other pioneers in this field. And I'm going to uh, finish by thanking a, a number of um, students and postdocs and uh, uh, undergraduates that have worked in the lab over all these years. All right, thank you so much. Maybe we can get Dr. Ramaswamy back in here too. So we have uh, 15 minutes for um, 
some questions and I want to let everyone know that this is going to um, you know, more or less wrap up the, the kind of hard science of the, of the program and then the, the rest of the day is going to be focused mostly on um, Dr. Dr. Gomez's uh, life. Um, so I want to I'm going to start something that I was curious um, as I was watching um, uh, Dr. Ramaswamy and Dr. Sukis's talk about you know, thinking about where we come, you know, I, I like Dr. Sukis took it all the way back to, to Dr. Crow. So uh, uh, to pioneering work, I believe with his wife and daughter as well, uh, that were involved in some of that early research. Um, but kind of where, think about where we're going in the future. And, and the biggest thing I wanna know is in each of your areas, what you foresee now is the biggest hurdles to advancements. Uh, I don't know who wants to take that first. I guess I can, I can try. Um... In terms of uh, mathematical modeling, we have definitely great advantage for sure when you compare the situation uh, 50, 60 years ago. This is both in terms of, I think, the appreciation by the community, which has started to change, but also because of the resources. I mean, it's um, just looking at the publication of Dr. Gomez, is, you can understand the difficulty and what they need to what they had to overcome just to get analytical solutions and the complexity of these solutions. Now we have an enormous computational power. Um, it's almost uh, unlimited uh, to some extent. All right, so these are the big advantages. Now, these advantages, as always, for the modeling is um, integration with the experiments, um, getting parameters, um, be able to convince experimental collaborators of funding institutions that um, uh, we need to do specific experiments to get quantitation. It's definitely much more interesting to identify a new mechanism or a new chemical, but uh, at some point we need to go back and uh, try to get some numbers behind some of the interactions. And this is a, a little more difficult to convince um, collaborators as well as funding institutions. Uh, yeah, so just to add, as far as hurdles go, I think, um, what I have observed over the years is um, there are two hurdles that are somewhat connected. One is uh, this sort of uh, focus on a number of studies. And I think this is particularly true in the area of uh, tissue engineering, where um, a lot of the studies are essentially repeated. And, you know, while there perhaps is some subtle novelty to that particular study, ultimately, we already know that this has a problem, this approach has a problem. Yet you see the same approach published about 10 times by different investigators without recognizing that this approach fundamentally is not gonna work. And so I think, um, you know, on that, basis, a good example would be, again, with the valve studies where people continue to implant valves with stem cells, knowing that the stem cells are going to cause an overburden of fibrotic tissue formation. So I think as uh, researchers, we need to be very in tune with all the literature that's connected to our field so that we avoid making the same mistakes and I think even like, uh, as I mentioned during my, my talk, you know, even going back to the 40s with Dr. Gomez's work, there is really a lot that we can learn from what has already been done. And then I think the other aspect of it is that given that, uh, and I think Dr. Uh, Monjak Novakovic had mentioned this, trying to specify problems going from quote her words, from the bedside to the bench is critical because then we can recognize what clinicians, at least in BME, what clinicians are facing day to day, what their specific problems are. And essentially, I think, uh, you know, being able to connect with those physicians in a way, and of course, making good collaborations is a really challenging task. But once you have those, I think we can then focus our, our uh, strategies on really areas that have a need. And of course, last but not least, we also have to make a, a, a way to sort of overcome certain stigmas 
that relate to you know funding agencies that think oh okay modeling that does nothing for us or tissue engineering uh, they they just promise more than they can deliver that's never going to happen and I think those type of stereotypes uh, is another hurdle that we need to overcome. But from our standpoint, what we can do is hopefully. Uh, you know, make good good collaborations, identify real problems in the clinic, and then and hopefully convince uh, reviewers that this is really something that can work. Yeah, I mean, it, I think in, in our area, uh, suitable models is, is uh, a difficult problem for us, especially thinking about long term um, diseases that, that we study. But then also getting those parameters and studying things at the level that Dr. Sukius was talking about as well. You know, you have to have the appropriate conditions to be able to get those. And I think that's always a hurdle for us too. You know, even thinking through things like um, uh, we're, that we're not very good at predicting things. We're not very good at predicting constitutive relationships uh, and understanding how tissue is going to behave mechanically, right? We can make experimental measures and make some models, but we're not very good at kind of predicting in the future. So that's that's another thing. And then to Dr. Ramaswamy's point, this is an interesting, you know, maybe area to think about, uh, you know, especially with a, a broad audience here, is I think that there's still this um, view, at least in the in the larger public, and even, even if you think talk to clinicians, um, that uh you know, biomedical engineering is still Im immature in many ways, and and, and in fully integrating kind of engineering and and physical sciences and math modeling into biology, I don't think happens early on, right? I mean, if you think about taking biology in high school, you're thinking about classification, say like kingdom, phylum, class order, blah 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 blah, right? And you're not. How do we start overcoming that? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, and maybe your own experiences of doing it in your classroom. Might be a ripe one for Dr. Sukhi because he teaches the you know, graduate level course on doing that. Yeah, I mean, it, it has not been easy, but I think the, the attitudes has begun to change. Um, what I try to highlight in the classroom is that uh, perhaps the, the, the novel thing that our students bring in line with uh, perhaps the vision of uh, Dr. Gomez is that uh, they can bring the quantitation to process and systems. Uh, sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes the systems and the pathologies are so complex and people are not going to trust the models. But as biomedical engineers, one thing that separates us from biologists, for example, or physicians or clinicians or physiologists is the ability to uh, provide uh, and describe um, systems and processes in a quantitative way. Um, and this has usually a lot of advantages and has difficulties. But it's uh, one thing that um, separates us and uh, it looks like it's, it's gaining traction. So uh, definitely we need to, and we try to cultivate it in the students, to our students, both in the, in the classrooms and in the labs. Yes, um, I, I also agree with uh, Nick's comment that, uh, you know, I've seen a positive change, uh, particularly in our students. Uh, I would say over the last uh, decade or so, I've seen, uh, of course, a lot more interest in students to continue their education beyond an undergraduate degree. And many of them have, in fact, uh, also enrolled within our own uh, graduate degree program. I think in, in part also a uh, huge uh, you know, gratitude needs to go to Dr. Riera being our GPD uh, for really promoting a lot of our students to continue the work. Um, so. Uh, I think, you know, that that I've definitely seen that evolution, but I think if I have a suggestion, um, not just for faculty, but also for the students, it's really a two way conversation is to recognize that, you know, science and biomedical engineering is not just about science. There's a lot of topics outside of the context of just science and engineering, you know, the clinical uh, aspects that I talk about with the collaborations. Also, there's a lot of legal regulatory components. And so, you know, when I teach, let's say my role in my, my scope as an instructor, let's say for transport phenomena, and I talk about fixed law or something like that, uh, perhaps students are seeing me as just this guy teaching transport. But I think if we can take that conversation deeper and say, you know, how does fixed law govern, let's say within the cardiovascular system, or are there other diffusion models that could characterize it? 
um, I think you really have to think about everything beyond the scope of just a course. The course is important for founding, you know, to, to establishing a foundation. But beyond the scope of the course, I really encourage students as well as faculty to talk about how, uh, as the saying goes, you know, all models are wrong, but you know, some models can be useful. And so how can we make these models that we learn theoretically useful in our real world applications and actually make a positive difference? I think that's an area that we need to continue to work on, but I'm still very much uh, glad to see more of our students pursue graduate education a lot more now compared to even like five years ago. To tie this into the next uh, uh, next yeah, segment, but one one thing I wanted I wanted to point out now in this context is also uh, the translational aspect and the friction that we as biomedical engineers sometimes suffer suffer when we try to uh, you know put out there in, in a clinical context our research, and I think that is another example that uh, Dr. Gomez, um, you know, set the, the pathway and, and create, um, you know, a, a strategy how to do that. He, as a reminder, he was an MD, but he also got the degree in mathematics. And we're talking about in 1929. So at that time, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, resistance in bringing mathematics to solve clinical problems, and as you will see when when we address this in when I address this in in the in my, in, in the talk that I'm going to give uh, at two thirty, uh, you will see that that is that was a, a big issue at that time. We su suffer the same issues even now. We are not as a biomedical engineer. Sometimes we are not considered engineers. And whenever we approach a clinical uh, collaborators, we have sometimes frictions, and and we uh, it's hard to penetrate that niche. And I think uh, what what I believe is the path, and and has been already in in uh, in Dr. John vision, is to get more connected with the College of Medicine, at FIU in general, in, in, in as a strategy, and created, uh, you know, uh, MD, PhD degrees, perhaps with a PhD degree in biomedical and an, an, an MD degree. So that's something that I also think uh, Dr. Gomez is an example of, and uh, we should, uh, you know, um, work hard to, to, uh, to do that connection. Now, when we are moving to the new building, um, that is just next to uh, the College of Medicine. Maybe this could be a, a you know, a, a possibility to strengthen the connections. Mm -hmm.